So while uh, Janine's setting up, you, your switch is on that thing. Um, I was going to explain a little bit about the structure. For example, why I'm in the middle instead of on the end, which is where I should be. Um, that's because so she can see the slides. Um, but also, it, this is a conversation that's sort of structured in an unusual way, I think, which is that we really wanted to have a conversation amongst the three of us. But some of you are familiar with Janine's work, and some of you are not. So it's a combination, in a sense. Uh, we'll look at her work. It's going to be thematic, not chronological. It's not like an introduction to her work. And it's based on a set of questions that she asked us to craft. So Jonathan crafted some questions. I crafted some questions. We sent them to her. She grouped them together into themes and sent them back to us. And we've been back and forth since then. And so this is sort of that. We're going to be reading our questions, because we didn't want to have to memorize them. Um, but it will also be a conversation. So we're trying to work that out. And you'll get to see how it goes. So with that, uh, I will start, and I get to ask the first question. And the first question, as you'll see immediately, is not like an introductory question. It's like an already in the middle of a question. Uh, so, that's question. my fault. What? That's my fault. And that's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> it was her idea that we started with this. So, issues of intimacy and generosity seem critical to much of your work. You said, and I'm quoting, I really can't make a point without touching someone. It's a form of emphasis that transcends words. In the work, it's more extreme. I long for connection and see my objects as occupying the space between the viewer and myself. To be intimate with the object is to touch the viewer. End of the quote. And then my question was, could you talk more about how you perceive your relationship to your objects and to your viewer as it relates to intimacy? Janet. I think I really try to enter the object, of course. It's not quite possible, and that's kind of devastating for me, but I really do my best. And um, I think what happens is I feel like the, I'm meeting the viewer at the surface of the object. So I try to put myself onto that surface in a lot of different ways, which you're about to see, in order to have some connection with the viewer. Um, so the object is just kind of a surrogate for, for um, intimacy for me. Anyway, I thought I would answer your question by talking about this work that you see up here, and it's a piece that is showing right now in Munich, and it started at, at the Hayward Gallery in London. And um, I was asked to be in a show called Move, Choreographing You, and it's a show of choreographers and um, performance artists. And uh, it's about how the object moves the viewer. And so I was very excited about the show, and I called up the curator, I've never done this before, and said, you have to, you have to put me in the show. Uh, <laughs> and I conceived of a piece uh, for the show. And basically what I did is I wrote a love letter from the perspective of the artwork to the viewer. And then I asked the people in the coat check to sneak it into people's personal belongings. Um, the letter itself is written on a ripped off out sheet from the gallery guide. And so I thought I would I would uh, read that to you because it I felt like I'm I'm coming out of the closet in terms of my incredible love for the viewer and um, all my fantasies about who they might be. Anyway, it goes like this. The minute you saw me, you came straight over and then stopped, as if you couldn't think and move at the same time. It seemed that you had come to some conclusion because your thoughts started to leave you with such intensity. It was as though you had taken me into your body. I remained still, quietly absorbing my surrender to your desire. You came so close to me that I felt the breeze of your movement on, the, on my surface. Swept away by your burning attention, I felt as if I was made for you. I was completed by your presence. Will you carry me in your memory, or is that too much to ask? So I, I'd actually like to ask you a question. Um, and I'm very interested, actually, in what you just said about the viewer and the surface. And I want to come back to that in a little bit. But my first question, actually, is also a statement by you that I'd like you to elaborate on, and that is, you've seen it once, and I just thought this was absolutely fascinating. My body is a funnel, 
through which the world has been born. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I'm fascinated by that and I'm wondering how that relates to your work. Um, it's funny that you found that quote. Um, I wrote that quote for my press release for my last show, and my gallerist called me up and he was like, what? <laughs> your body is what? The world? What are you talking you know, And I was like, oh, I guess that's a little bombastic and a little bit grandiose. But I didn't mean it at all in that way. Um, um, it's funny that I came to funnel because I think of that as a sculptural shape, and I do imagine the whole world being sucked into this funnel, but, but I guess I was trying to talk about my creative process and how, I mean, maybe we're all this way, but we filter in all this information, and then we try to organize it, and for me, making art is a way to organize that, and then I feel like it's, it's sort of brought down into the thinner part, and and brought out in some way. So um, I guess we all have different ways of funneling. And um, and I would say that what's important for me is that my body is the funnel, not my brain. Um, I'm interested in the brain of the body. So uh, yeah, I was thrilled that you found that line. <laughs> so um, I was going to start by just showing you sort of a few older works to set the stage for some questions that we want, or things we want to talk about. So um, I wanted to start with Ween because even though it's a very old piece, it's actually the first piece I did out of graduate school. It kind of um, mapped out a certain territory that from, from, I mean, still my work deals with. So I thought it would be a good thing to begin with. What you're looking at are negative imprints in the wall. The first image you see is my breath. The second is my nipple. Then there are three latex nipples, you know, baby bottle tops. And the last form is the packaging that those three latex nipples come in. You know when you go to the drugstore, everything you buy has that vacuum form packaging with the cardboard vacuum or the three stack and fit into that form. So for me, I guess the important moment in this kind of sentence is the moment between the real nipple and the latex nipple. All the objects I deal with are somewhat like the latex nipple. They mediate our intimate interaction with our bodies. They replace the body or they define the body within culture. And um, I wanted to, with a title like Lean, I was thinking of stages of separation from the mother. But more importantly, I was thinking about stages of separation we go through with our own bodies as we're sort of weaned into the culture. So, Wanting to do a piece about absence, this wall is seamless to the architecture, so you can feel that these forms are missing. So this is my brother and I, and we're casting 600 pounds of chocolate. And um, uh, uh, the only way I could do it was to do 50 pound pours. So I'd wake them up every four hours and we'd do another pour. And there's the cube, and that's after about a month and a half of chewing. Same form. It's called no. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> same form, this time 500 pounds of lard. And then, um, oh, shoot on that as well, believe it or not. Um, then about two weeks into the exhibition, the entire cube of lard collapses onto the ground. And I realized that this was going to happen in my studio, and I had to make some quick decisions. Should I mix it with black? Should I put a cooling unit? And I decided that this aspect of the work was about the materiality. That's what 500 pounds of lard does. That's what I should let happen. Um, and then what I, I parenthetically did, say that I saw this at the Museum of Modern Art as it was leaking all over the floor, and everyone looked at part of it. Yeah, <laughs> But it's the thing that keeps the piece alive with their lack of control of this lard. And I thought it was so kind of uh, conceptually in keeping with the work because, you know, we all know how hard it is to control art in your own body. So anyway, what I did is I took the material that I spit out from those two cubes. The chocolate that I spit out, I, melt, I melted into these heart-shaped packaging for chocolate candy. And the lard that I spit out, I mixed with pigment and beeswax and made about 150 lipstick. And then I took all my products, I put it into a display, sort of like Bloomingdale's. Where, um, so 
there's a, I kind of think of this work as my art school exorcism. I kind of took everything I learned in art school and shoved it into one work, which I don't really recommend you to do, but I think I got a few things out of my system. Um, I started with the traditional idea of wanting to, um, to do the most traditional thing I could do as a sculptor, and that was to carve. But I was also interested in another tradition, the tradition of figurative sculpture. So I thought rather than to describe the body, I would talk about the body by the residue it left on the surface. And I put those two ideas together, and rather than use a hammer and chisel, I would use my mouth. And then I thought, I'm going to sculpt with my mouth, chocolate, so you know, the right choice of material. I don't know about you. And then I thought, I could kind of seduce you with this idea of chewing on 600 pounds of chocolate and then gross you out by the idea of the lard, which is what happens when you succumb to your desire for the chocolate, and then turn around and use that lard to make lipstick, which is, you know, what we use to make ourselves attractive, so someone will give us a heart box of chocolate. So, anyway, I'm amusing myself by that little story, but um, there's a lot of quotes happening piece, and I think the obvious one is minimalism. I thought I was being kind of funny by chewing on the minimalist cue. The talk around the piece at the time was that this was an angry critique of patriarchal art history. <laughs> <laughs> Got the joke. Um, and then, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, so consumer critique was something that everybody was talking about. So anyway, um, Sort of using the same idea of my body as a tool, I did this performance called Loving Care. This time, rather than sculpture, I was going to try to take on painting. And it's a performance piece where I fill a bucket to the top with Loving Care um, hair dye, and I um, use uh, my hair to mop the floor. Um, I was thinking, you know, this would be a pretty nice paintbrush. And so if I was going to paint with my hair, it seemed like hair dye was the appropriate choice. But this was mopping by making dirty. And the important thing for you to know about this performance was when I start, the room is filled with people. And as I mop the floor, I'm slowly pushing people out of the room. So that's important because I'm very vulnerable there on my hands and knees, but claiming the space of the museum and the gallery really empowering for me. And I was really thinking of my mom, you know, as a kid saying, Jan, you go out and play. You know, the, the kitchen floor is wet and how that, for that time, the kitchen was her space. So, um, and then the important quotes here is uh, Klein, Klein um, and Pollock. We know those amazing photos of Pollock doing his dance around the canvas. Um, that's why it's documented in this way. But, um, Eve Klein, do you know these paintings where he puts blue paint on the woman's body and they roll on the canvas? Well, what he said about that work is, rather than to paint the model, he wanted to paint with the model. And my response to that is that loving care is really about the conflict of trying to be the model and the master at the same time. Mm -hmm. So uh, lastly, I wanted to show you um, loving uh, like a lather and basically what happened here is I I cast myself seven times in chocolate and seven times in soap and I um, reshaped my image by licking the chocolate and washing the soap. So this gives you a close up of the piece. This is my favorite soap head. We spent about eight hours in the tub together. Um, <laughs> so um, I was thinking of uh, I asked myself why I make a self-portrait um, traditionally, why do I just do that, and I, I came up with a couple of answers. One is to immortalize yourself. Of course, I'm working with these ephemeral materials, so working against the grain of that. Um, but the other thing is this notion of making a public image, an image that you present to the world. And um, uh, I felt like maybe we're more ourselves alone appropriate way of um, describing self. So I'm going to let Janet so, take over here. Related to those things, one of the, or a series of the questions that we sort of lumped together 
for, that I generated raise issues related to, as you can imagine, feminism so, based on this work. So here's how I sort of stated this question in my Related to these ideas, uh, you engage in many subjects that have been of central importance to feminist artists from the 70s to today. <coughs> subjects that include the body, autobiography, handcraft, performance, references to anorexia in Naw, love-hate relationships one, with one's own appearance, as in Lincoln Lather. You've said, quote, soap, lard, chocolate, and paradigm all come in contact with the body and redefine or locate the body within our culture. You can tell she writes a lot, so there's lots of good stuff to quote. Um, these materials also have a specific relationship to women in our society. The gender of the viewer informs the reading of my work, end quote. And then my question continues. What is your connection to the feminist art movements for which you represent a younger generation? And do you welcome such an association or not? And then how does this relate to male as well as female viewers? Okay, there's a lot of questions there. Um, um, where do I begin? I'm proud to be a feminist. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, um, and I'm a little shocked that I find a lot of um, my women students not claiming that title. And I'm a little confused as to why uh, one would not claim that title. Because when I ask them, do they want to be part of the dialogue? Do they want to be paid equally? You know, all the questions that I think is what, what we were fighting, are fighting for, they say yes. And yet this label is somehow problematic. Um, so I guess I want to uh, give credit to all the great women artists that came before me, especially the ones that my work is particularly indebted to. So what happened to me in graduate school is that I was doing this work, and, and Mira Shore was my teacher. and. She looked at the work and she started to throw names at me. Um, mostly w women who were doing body work in the 70s, and um, I had never heard of them. And I went to the, to the library at the Rhode Island School of Design looking for Anna Wilkie, Carolee Schneeman, Anna Mendieta, and there were no books. And so Mira had to bring in her own catalogs to show me this work. And I looked at this work and I was like, it's been done. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I had to ask myself, what do I do now? And, uh, and then I guess the next question was, why, didn't, and why don't I know about it? I know about all these other artists. You know, why haven't I been taught this? Why haven't they become part of history? And we probably have all kinds of answers to those questions. Um, but I felt from that moment on, even though I wasn't looking at them to make the work, that I would claim them every chance I could. Um, and I feel that, in retrospect, that the reason I went straight there is because we needed to, to think about these things and they ha it hadn't been absorbed. Um, into the culture. And so it made sense, you know, because I was obviously being educated about the 80s feminists, and, and I almost feel like you can equally see their concerns in my work, but the language of the 70s was what really interested me. So I think that, you know, I think what happened in the 80s is that women um, understood why the 70s weren't um, taken seriously, and so they put their feminism into a language that was already known. And so they allowed me to kind of go back to the 70s and reclaim that language. So what about male viewers? Male viewers. Can you both ask this question? Hi. <laughs> you both yes. asked this que question in, this, in, in a asked, funny like way. Too, yeah. And I was surprised um, because I feel that the feminist movement is probably, in the recent history, one of the most important movements, I think, in affecting art. And I feel that as we define ourselves as women, um, and we do have to self-define before, we can't assume a voice, um, unfortunately. There's this kind of a self-definition before speaking. I think that's interesting. But I feel as we define who we are and as language change, of course, we've heard 
from, from male artists about themselves and about women artists, and now we need to hear that from women. And I feel as, as we self-define, so do men. So I feel like my work is as much for men as it is for women. Um, and men can be famous too. <laughs> What else? There's another question you asked in that set. Did I cover it all? Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm up, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. I want to actually turn the conversation uh, just for a minute and talk about spirituality for a moment. Um, and I have a, a kind of a burst of questions, three, three questions in a row uh, that we can navigate through. Uh, so before I ask some specific questions about a couple of the pieces with regard to spirituality, I just want to ask generally if you could just speak for a couple of minutes about the role of spirituality in your work um, and your background, too, in terms of religion more generally. Um, were you raised in a religious household? Where does your interest in spirituality come from? Uh, and what is its presence in your work? And then I have two more specific, very specific questions about individual pieces. Um, I was raised a Catholic. Um, and I went to Raised by Nuns, uh, both for grade school and for high school. I was in an all-girls um, high school uh, boarding school. And so that iconography was around me, definitely. Um, and I'm totally uh, interested in the Virgin Mary as my only female deity. Um, as a, a sort of example of how a woman should be and what a strange example she is. So, um, so as a feminist, I try to rework her to my own liking um, and figure her out a bit. Um, but I'm from the Caribbean, and um, uh, my heritage is Trinidad, and there, the, you know, we, uh, it's a very, interesting mix of cultures. So syncretism is something I'm, um, it's like my natural way to like, I think when I was in high school, I went and announced to the nuns that I was gonna go to a different church every Sunday. And they said, well, if you go to Catholic service, you can do that. And I guess since then, I've been going to, you know, following, looking for the similarities between many different philosophies and ways of thinking. Um, and so I, I look to the Virgin Mary, but I equally look to Yamanja and Kali and um, Kuan Yin, you know, I, I look to all those deities and what they have to offer us as women and as a, as a kind of example of a way of being. Um, so I think that there's the surface um, I, Christian iconography, and then there's the closet spirituality that is also infiltrates the work. I have a, a follow-up question. So you've answered it a little bit, and if you feel you've answered it, we can go on. But I just wanted to ask some specific, uh, with regard to some specific works, like 2038, Inhabit, If I Die Before I Wake, all suggest very, to me at least, an interest in evoking, reworking, or revising subjects of the mother. Yeah. largely from a Christian iconographic viewpoint. Uh, did you want to speak for a minute or two about some of those specific Yeah, things? I have to, a, to flesh few, out what we just talked about. a few mother works yeah. for you. Um, what is this piece? And it's your basic, um, you know, uh, porcelain prayer nightlight. The only thing that is a little weird about it is that one hand is mine and the other one is my mother's. Um, and it's called If I Die Before I Wake. I don't know if you guys know that prayer. But um, my mother used to tell me that prayer, and one day I actually listened to the words, and I thought that's incredibly morbid prayer to tell a child right before they get to sleep. Um, and then I have this other memory of being with my grandmother in church, and I used to love to, to pull up her skin. And you know when you're old, it takes a while for the skin to get back. <laughs> so my favorite thing to do during church. And she, I thought it was so great, and she was like, oh, your skin is so, you know, bouncy, your mind's... So anyway, um, the weird thing about my mom is she has the exact same hands as me, 
except that now that she's aging, you know, arthritis has bent them and she's gotten wrinkles. And so for me to kind of put the hands together as a way to kind of contemplate my own aging. Um, and I have a six-year-old at home, and I can't tell you how many hours I spend taking her from the wake state to the sleep state. And a lot of time contemplating this fear of going to sleep, which I think at the end is this fear of, sur of death and, and surrender. Um, that's how the piece came about. Can I ask you some very yes. basic, what topic is it? It's hands up. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like I know. <laughs> Um, so this is my mom. You didn't mention this work, but um, but I was I put it in here because of, I kept telling my mother, you have to look as though it's look out the window like it's the Annunciation. Um, but anyway, I was trying to make an image that would be kind of familiar to you from 17th century painting. You know, the woman in a domestic setting, but then it would be so kind of boring that it would take a while for you to realize that there's three feet coming out in one of the dress of it. And you realize I'm still having problems separating. <laughs> um, so this is 2038. And um, you know, it's funny, with this piece I wanted to do a kind of crash scene. So I had the camera way back and I wanted this thing to be happening just in the corner. And um, it happened because I was uh, we got to show in Sweden in this uh, uh, big castle in the woods, and they had a working dairy farm. And right away, I was like, "Can I go see the farm?" Because I come from the Bahamas, we, don't, we had one cow in the whole life. <laughs> so, you know, I walk into this this barn, and they're using bathtubs as troughs. What's that about? And then this next thought was, if I get in, will the cows still drink? Well, let me tell you, cows are very curious animals. And, <laughs> came over. and I'm trying to get this image of this, you know, angelic moment, peaceful moment between mother and child, and I'm freaking out. <laughs> um, but anyway, the piece is called 2038 because that's the number of the cows a year. And I was thinking that it's really weird that we, our relationship to these cows are kind of like a, a biological machine or something, which would contrast the kind of tenderness I was looking for in the image. But um, back to your question, I'm kind of fascinated by, like, the Virgin Mary's not allowed many physical things, you know, uh, the Virgin birth, um, ascending, she doesn't get to die, ascends into heaven, but she gets to this. So that seemed like the only physical thing that she gets to do, so I really wanted to, to go there with the work. And then I should say that I took hundreds of photos, and then just at the moment when the, the photographer took the camera off the tripod and walked towards me, this cow came and drank as if it was drink, drinking from my nipple. And so I owe the, the piece to the cow. Um, this is a little hard to see, but it's a, it's a fo small photograph, and um, it's just what it looks like, a picture of me. Um, holding my leg, Coddle. the piece is called Coddle. And, um, you know, I was thinking about um, painting again and put the colors of the Virgin Mary and so forth. Um, but there were a few things I was thinking about here of, um, I guess I was at the age of, of being able to have a child and questioning that and wondering as a sculptor, what it means to have a child and thinking about it sculpturally, about taking something from the inside and putting it on the outside in order to see it. Um, and trying to sort of disembody my leg um, in you know, a way of seeing myself really. Um, so I think I'll stop here. Can I ask you a question yes. about inhabit? I think, is that next? No. Oh, it's not? Oh, it's you know. coming. Okay. Oh, if, if you're go, let's go with the flow. I'm sorry. I'm no, it's good. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. And have it go. Let's put it out of it. Here we are. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I really would like to talk about it. Have it. Um, I am extremely intrigued by this piece. Um, 
it has so many associations, at least for me as a male view. Um, I just, I look at it and I see suspension, levitation, restraint, aging through references of cobwebs, spinning of time, a house as a body, rebirth, transfiguration, uh, assumption, and my question to you was, is this all part of motherhood? Um, and then before you address that, I interject my own question related to it, because I looked at this and I saw an entirely different list of things immediately um, about the same work, which are references again back to feminism, feminist art history. So I see Frida Kahlo and the corset, and I see Louise Bourgeois with her woman house drawings, and I see Mira Shapiro with her dollhouse, which is part of the other woman house project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this relates to my idea to the issue of motherhood as four mothers in a very different way. Somewhat, somewhat maturity of that. Anyway, this piece seems very loaded. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, as in the other works that I just described, the two kind of come together in, in some way. Um, I definitely, well, I was looking at this image um, to think about how we think of the Virgin Mary as the church. And I love, I love this image because she's so architectural. And it's such a strong uh, pose and how she's holding her patrons with her. Um, so, so there was this idea, I, it's such a, can I tell you about how I came to the idea for the piece? I was, um, I do a lot of dancing, and it's an improvisational kind of dance, and um, there's this one woman that dances in the whole group, and I'm always very attracted to her. And it's almost when I have my eyes closed, I go straight to this woman. And um, we were dancing together at one point, and the music was playing, and she was dancing to the slower rhythm in the music, and I was dancing to the, to, you know, to the to a, a beat that was much quicker, and I got this idea that I, I was a spider making a web, and she was kind of holding the space for me. And then later I found out that she's actually a dance therapist and probably really good at holding the space for, for people to move. And so then I got obsessed with that. I wanted to, um, to have a spider make a web between my legs. So um, being uh, uh, naive as I am, I started calling up all the s spider scientists, you know, Gainesville, Harvard, and I'm like, I want to do this thing, and they're like, oh, eat of the body, it takes a long time, I don't know if you could, you know, stay still for that long. And so I was like, stay still, no problem, you know? So I, I thought, I'll just get a harness, and I'll put it under my clothes, and I'll, you know, then I can stand all night, and the spider will make the web, and that'll be great. And so I started calling people from the harness world, and I didn't quite want to say what I wanted to do, and then finally the guy on the phone was like, come on, lady, I've heard all kinds of things. <laughs> So I told him, and so he starts to give me a quick tour through the harnesses, and I find oh, this harness. Um, and it's the harness for when somebody's like in a movie where someone's blown up and they have to go back like that so that the body isn't jerked. And immediately I thought, spider web. Um, and it kind of came together, so I thought, well, I should show the harness so it can be, it'll be a web within a web. And then I thought, well, I've got to keep the spider down between my legs so it wants to do this thing down there. So I thought I would make some kind of cage that keeps it down there, and then I thought I can make a house within a house. So, um, so there's kind of a long road to this image. And then I, don't, I think you're picking up on these rays of light, right? Um, which kind of just happened. Um, nice that the spider web also can be these rays of light. Um, and then the suspension, that kind of came later. Um, uh, but I was really thinking about how, in fact, I am the home. That, that I, well, I was also at the same time reading Winnicott. Uh, and Winnicott is a psychologist that worked with, with mothers and their children. And what Winnicott said to us was that to be a good mother was not to be overbearing to the child, but to make the child, to give the child enough space for their imagination to unfold. 
Um, and so, so that's what I was thinking about of the house as this kind of space where, this safe space where this delicate web can be made and how can I be there for my daughter and yet not intrude. I, I, when I was first having her, I asked all the women, all the mothers I knew how to be a good mother and there's one woman who said just, just stay out of the way. I thought that was really good motherly advice. Um, unless the child was going to be in harm in some way. Um, and then, of course, I was thinking about the altarpiece, which you probably picked up on with the, with the three panels. Um, anyway, I think that I should introduce you. So those references to the, those other artists were not in your head? Oh, oh they're, they, well, what's weird is I never thought of the Frida Kahlo reference. Um, and, then I, <laughs> and then I realized that her that the postcard of that painting is on the wall in, in, next to my computer. Um, <laughs> I was definitely... Can I ask one other question before you go on? Yes, Mary, did the spider actually... So this is the spider. Um, and um, uh, so I was definitely thinking of Lizzie Spichois, and she actually calls the spider her mother. And I should say that this is the best assistant I've ever had. Um, that this spider I found on, it had made a web in my backyard between the strings of my daughter's swing. We put the spider into the kitchen. It made its web parallel to the picture of her playing. Stayed there for three days while I put the house on maybe 13 times and didn't move. In fact, when I first opened it up, there was a pie shape missing from the web. And then we closed it. I had breakfast. I opened it up. It had finished. So um, again, I owe a lot um, to the spider. The funny thing about the image is you don't need to know the spider is there. It's almost like I needed the spider to get me, like the image went way out of control in all different directions. Um, but I don't know. Does that answer all of your questions? Transfigure. Oh, we should talk about the assumption. Um, and the, this idea of um, a suspension. And I feel like that is the state of motherhood. Of, um, uh, you have to let go of having any control at all. And um, so I was interested in that space between suspension and assumption, <laughs> definitely. And definitely that pose, I'm looking at it but I will start to claim her immediately. Go for it. <laughs> claim her or credit her? Credit her. Yeah, well, so one moment she got in there somehow. So um, I just wanted to show you one more image because I wanted to talk about the other side of the story, the perspective from my daughter's um, side. And since my daughter was born, she's always been obsessed with my belly button. And um, she sleeps with me at night, and she sleeps with her finger in my belly button. And if I turn over in the night, she gets up, turns me on my back, and gets back in. <laughs> it's hard to sleep that way. Anyway, um, when I was first teaching her to feed herself, I gave her the spoon, and the first thing she did was try to feed my belly button. And I looked at it, and I was like, you know, she's making my work right here. I said, Paul, get the camera. <laughs> and um, I just thought it was just a beautiful image of reciprocity, you know, that she was kind of enacting the umbilical cord and sort of bringing me back to my own kind of fetal memory. So, but I think we can move on to performance. We want to talk about performance. Yeah, I, I would like to ask a question. Um, this has come up a lot in, in class with students uh, with regard to performance in your work. It's a two-part question. Um, very straightforward. What, what are your thoughts on, on performative work that occurs in front of a live audience versus its documentation and its re-experience? And I'm fascinated because I did not know that there was a real Hans name with like agenda with those photographs you took of Loving Care, which I think is really interesting. Um, and the second part of it is how, how have you negotiated the possibilities of new image technologies as they developed in the last 
few years. And I, I'm asking this in the context of your show last year, especially in New York. You had a range of media of surfaces, so to speak, through which viewers were experiencing or accessing your work and your body. So there were still photographs, there was video running, there was in certain cases of only ephemera only from performances. Um, so what are your thoughts on this, the various aspects of access, non-access, visibility, uh, invisibility, live, documentation, all that stuff? And I've been wanting to ask you for years. <laughs> um, uh, I'm really excited that you asked me this question because I really care about this and I feel like nobody cares about this except you. <laughs> um, and I really, for myself, created a real line between these different things. So I never put out in the world as a piece documentation of a performance. So every time you've seen documentation of love and care, it's in this kind of context where I can create, explain to you what it is, which I think separates me from a lot of my contemporaries that do performance work. Um, so when I make a photograph, I think of it more like a painting because even though it looks like a performative gesture that has been captured, it is totally conceived. Um, so, so that that distinction is really important for me. Um, but I would say if there's one th thing that is um, my issue or my what I try to do is how do you tell the story of the making on the surface of the object. And so, um, how do you make this, for want of a better word, performative object? And I think at the beginning, um, I was thinking about, you know, like coming in on the scene of a crime and leaving the clues for the viewer to construct what I did. Um, and I was thinking that the more clearly I could communicate that, the more generous. Um, I'm starting to change my mind and I'm starting to leave little holes in the story because I'm starting to become interested in how the viewer fills those holes <coughs> and in fact that I'm starting to think that that's more generous because then the story becomes theirs and there, in fact there is different ways to fill those holes so it becomes many different stories and that's just you know been a matter of being able to let go of control a little bit um, there's something else I wanted to tell you. Oh, um, I was thinking on the train, look, looking at this question, that I think at the beginning what I was trying to do was remove the sensational part, right? So I was taking away the, you know, me biting, on my hands and knees biting the chocolate. Or, um, um, you know, I didn't show you that big wrecking ball hitting the building. So I thought that, I, I knew that that's like triggers the viewer's imagination, that that's the one thing they, they and that I thought that it's a stronger um, experience for you to imagine that than for me to give you that. Um, so a lot of the work is constructed through a kind of absence, like I've intentionally, you know, I'm at the center of the work and I've kind of removed myself. What I realized is that when you don't give the viewer what they want, then they become obsessed with it. And so I wasn't intentionally trying to do that, and then I had to deal with that. Okay, we do that. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of ways in which her work references, your work references our historical sources of all kinds. We talked about a bunch of them. But I wanted to get to one work in particular, which is Conduit. Um, which is a, do you have an image of it? Yeah, but I, mean, I just want to show you this oh, object. Okay. Oh, great. Want me to talk about this object? Sure, I guess you question? want to. Mm -hmm. I guess you want to, so sure. Um, so, this is such a long story. Can I tell the whole story? Mm -hmm. What's 
Oh, yes, it's all conduit. So I have time. Okay, so what happened is when I was a little kid, my brother was reading this book about pirates, and there was this woman called Anne Bonet, and she's a female pirate, and he told me that she disguised herself as a male pirate by with this apparatus that she used for peeing singly. And I was, there's a little, you know, I was like, wow, that's cool. So I never forgot this thing. And then recently a friend of mine said, oh, I saw this thing online that I think you'd be interested in. And it's called a travel mate. And it is an apparatus made for women to pee standing up when they're traveling or hiking or whatever. And um, so we went to that travel mate. So, so I, was very, I was very excited about this this object, um, and so I was like, okay, I think I would like to somehow make this into some kind of um, art object. Um, so I have to tell you about another story, which is about the nuns, and the nuns used to tell me my body is a temple, and um, I, I don't know if it's because I'm a sculptor or just a little dance, but I took that literally, and I thought, I could be architect. <laughs> and so that idea came back to me with the travel mate because I was like, if I turn this object into a gargoyle and used it, then somehow I could um, be the architecture. Uh, so and the other part of my question, just to frame it, was that this reminded me of Eve Klein's leap into the void, you know, standing on top of an architecture. talk about that image because it's really important to me. Um, so anyway, I decided that I would cast it in copper, thinking about copper piping in the bathroom, but also thinking about, you know, decorative, um, these decorative guys uh, on uh, cathedrals. And I chose the griffin because the griffin is a hybrid. It's a half, half lion, half uh, bird. And I figured when I use the object, I'm a kind of hybrid. So that seemed to make sense. And then I like the copper because, I don't know if you know, but um, one of the ways they patina copper is with urine. Um, so then the urine could actually be part of the object. So then I decided that I need a church to pee off. So <laughs> again, again, I start calling all these churches, sincerely explaining the piece, and everyone is like, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> So I'm really panicking because my show is coming and finally there's this patron of the arts who has access to the Chrysler. And believe it or not, I got to pee off of the Chrysler. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't know, but that bird doesn't look so different than mine. <laughs> so that was a really exciting. But anyway, what was the question? <laughs> um, I do want to talk about exuberance because that picture of Klein is such a notice image of him leap into the void. Leap into the void. He's like out the window. Oh, that's incredible. We should also talk about technology, like how you would make that image now versus how we probably made that image then. But. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, that image has always been to me about the creative process, about a kind of unknown, and there's such a feeling in that image that, that I, oh, I should say that I took many images on the Chrysler, and you know in those buildings that are, there's this kind of wick, gusts of wind that go between the buildings, and this gust came up and it did this crazy thing with my hair, and I thought, I'm a pirate. <laughs> I'm a lion. So it seemed clear that this was the image that I should choose for, for the piece. And it has a similar mystery of not knowing what's underneath. Right, right. And I had to prop myself up to get above the bar, you know, so that you, you know, and then the wind hit and I went to my knees for this totally terror. I thought, I'm a tightrope walker, this is no problem. And then the wind came and I was like, I can be blown off the building. <laughs>
So I have one final question, and then we're going to open it to the audience, I promise. Um, and the final question is, uh, related to everything you said, here's another quote. Uh, I'm interested in that fine line between how much information I give and how much information I withhold, and my whole body of work plays with that. The key word for me is empathy. So empathy. Empathy. Um, <coughs> well, that idea of giving information and withholding is, it relates to what we were talking about before. Um, but the notion of empathy is important for me because I feel that um, we don't usually use empathy to enter a contemporary artwork. I think we go through a much more um, objective process of decoding information and putting it together to make meaning. Um, but uh, I was much more interested in people imagining what it would be like to chew on 600 pounds of chocolate um, or pee off the Chrysler. Um, and then, so I know that those are not neutral things, um, so I know that you have a body and you have a kind of visceral reaction to this thing that I've done. And that immediately puts you into a subjective relationship to the artwork. And then if you want to analyze your own response, that's kind of up to you. Um, so yeah, that's the, the kind of position that, in terms of trying to communicate, that I'm really interested in. I think that brings us back to the first thing about generosity and news. Mm -hmm. So on that little circular note, people have questions. Well done. And do, you, do we have a mic for questions? We have one for you I think it's going to be fun. symbolizes this, you know, devil, some say he's a devil, so, you know, or, or evil creature to scare away um, uh, people from the church or, or bad people from the church. Um, others say he's a protector. Um, and so I was thinking of, you know, this water that comes into my body and goes sort of back to the funnel question. <laughs> um, maybe that's where that thought came from. <laughs> um, but what my favorite thing to do is to hand people the travel mate and be like, what do you think this is? Um, and that's the first thing they always say about medicine. And so I think once you're dealing with orifices, there's some <laughs> sculptural relationship between <laughs> objects. That, so thank you. Hello. Oh my goodness, that's loud. <laughs> I was interested to hear you say that you are a tightrope walker, and also about your improvisational dancing. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about your physical practice and how it affects your art, or if it does. Thank sure. you. Um, I would say that I always am, um, have this other thing that I'm doing that is something new that I'm learning. Um, and it's usually physical. Um, I think for me that I'm um, uh, that I'm a motor. I think through movement, and so and I really believe that my I already have that my ideas are kind of stuck in my body, and I just have to find them in there. 
and somehow through movement they get dislodged. Um, uh, so recently, sorry, I've been doing a lot of dancing as a way to, um, you know, we talked about the body thinking as opposed to the mind, as having the mind drop into the body and entering a kind of, uh, entering the unconscious consciously. Um, so I find that that happens for me, particularly through movement. So there's always this parallel practice that is going on. And then I also think that when you learn something new, something gets jiggled up there. <laughs> um, and I'm really not interested in getting too good at anything. I think that's why I'm always like, you know, I work in a medium and then I run in the other direction because I'm afraid that I will get good at it. And that there's something about only being on the edge of control when I'm making that allows things to happen that um, I don't think I could get to any other way. So, and I would say that the both the dancing and the tiger walking for me are a kind of, of meditation, a kind of contemplative space, allow me for some kind of contemplative space, which is also important for the creative process. I do a kind of dance called Five Rhythms. It's a, it's a, it's a urban phenomena, contemporary phenomena, but, but is draws on many forms of ecstatic dancing, different traditions of ecstatic dancing. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, your selection of like your physical appearance, such as your costuming or the fact that you keep your hair long and usually down in your images, and then also um, kind of the parallel of like anonymity that happens in like NAW because we don't actually ever see you, but then versus your photographic work, which has your actual physical image in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's always such a problem what one wears. Um, because it's as neutral as you try to be, it always has so much meaning. Um, so there was endless discussion about whether I should be peeing off the Chrysler in a dress or in pants. And would I be imitate like I was conscious, like I think I'm cross-dressing as a building, but in reality, people want to think of that as a penis. So, so like, do I want to push the reading in another direction, and how to do that, or pants make it more, you know, these kinds of questions. And, and uh, you know, I kind of wanted to match the building, so I used that slate gray. And, um, but then I finally decided on the dress because it kind of does what our Lady of Mercy does, you know, that, that kind of, it created like a stage for this gargoyle, you know, like the curtains were being lifted for so there was something very strong about that. Um, you know, with Loving Fear, I just wanted to extend the, the, my hair, in fact, like a big, you know, that my body was an extension of those gestures as I moved. I got a lot of flack for that outfit. <laughs> um, it was a little too dancy, I think, in retrospect. Um, so yeah, those are, so really, I mean, with, with Inhabit, um, my shirt is actually the same material as the curtains. We need to talk about something about Inhabit, because you asked me the technology question that I never answered which is that that photograph is made out of 150 photographs. So I had to stay incredibly still um, because I wanted, because there's the level of detail like the curtain and the web and stuff. So I had to stay very still and then we took all those photographs, then they were digitally um, put together. Um, and that's a decision, like for instance, um, People always ask me why I do the things I do because, you know, with photography now, I could construct that whole image very easily and not have to go through the amount of pain it took to make it. 
So um, I just want to interject for a second on that just to follow up. Uh, so, so that's really more, as you said, that's more of a image and, and less of an action or a performative event document. Right, yes. Maybe in the sense that that's versus some of the other ones, which you're actually using the technology to document <coughs> something more performative. Yes, right. And then, you know, I guess in time being more even sophisticated about how that documentation should happen and how it shouldn't get in the way of the performance and all those questions. And spending as much time conceiving the documentation as making the piece because in the end that that's what's going to survive. And this is such a contemporary problem right now, like with last year with the show Marina Abramovich in New York and the issue of performance and where's its history, what's its documentation, how will it survive, in what capacity, what form. That so. was like the best show of the teaching tool because you're like, here's the blurry black and white photograph with the text and, you know, us older ones are like, oh, we love that. You know, and then there's the actual like performance, but then it framed. You know, it was right. crazy. And then next to each other, so you can really compare the two, which one worked better. And what I'm interested in is how um, these pieces that I love so much, I never really experienced. And more than documentation, um, I'm interested in storytelling as documentation and how we create those stories, because those stories are very fluid and change with the time and what's important at the time. So to think about, you know, how you put it out there and who those viewers are and how they become the storytellers. Because all those pieces I know were my professors retelling actually. And when you have a blurry black and white photograph, you can project whatever you want into it, <laughs> which happens a lot. But um, this long hair, what do you think? Should I cut it? <laughs> um, I, have, I have been bald, um, so I've had the full experience of, uh, and um, yeah, it's a funny trope, the long hair. Um, and it allows me to be the Virgin Mary. But, but I see your question, I don't have an answer for it. I just thought it was interesting you kept it down for specific uh, documentation, but then, like in uh, 2038, your hair is up, but it seems to go with the kind of beautiful quality you kept it. Yeah, well, you know, I'm thinking of Vermeer. I also have a pearl earring. You know, they're little things. I'm just playing, doing these little things, but maybe someday somebody will notice. Um, so, so yeah, there are those things that I'm doing consciously to create certain effects. But then, you know, I was all equally thinking of Vermeer and thinking of, um, you know, the the bubble bath advertisement of like mom in the tub, re finally relaxing because the kids are, you know, those those kinds of things equally. And then a <laughs> I think they want to turn the tape. Is this being taped? So I have a question about, um, you were kind of talking about your changing story. I heard you speak in 2001, and at that point, well, I guess you were talking about Ween, and 2038 and the piece where it's the cast of the inside of your mother's hand in the spoon. And you were talking a lot about kind of exploring the idea of motherhood. And I'm just curious and interested how your relationship to those pieces has changed now that you are a mother. I, mean, I guess before you were talking about a lot of how it was ex exploration for you. So now that you're there, I'm just kind of curious what you think about that older work. Well, remember when I said that with Coddle, it was about taking something from the, like, can you ever know your inside? And having a child is like taking the inside of me on the outside in order that you can see it. Well, now that I have a child, and I look at her, she has nothing to do with me. I'm just so, like, not, you know, and so that's sort of an interesting experience. I. I, um, I think Ween is totally an idealized image 
nothing to do with the real experience of nursing. Um, nursing is one of the most incredible things I've ever got to do in my life. Um, uh, in terms of connecting to another person. Um, and I, I always like, in those early years, like to just feel my daughter's bones and thinking all of this grew off of my body. Like, how is that possible? Just like, so profound to me. Um, so yeah, I think that, and I think that things have changed a lot. And I'm only now with Inhabit and and one another that photo of her feeding my stomach. Those are just the, my first tries at trying to understand it from the other side. I don't think that I, it takes me so long to figure out what happened. So I feel that those are kind of rough attempts at um, trying to see the relationship from the other side. Um, and then of course my mom is getting old, so now I'm seeing her, you know, fading away from me. That separation is also huge. And dealing with my own aging, my own body aging, which is also pretty interesting. What was your relationship like with your mother? Well, <laughs> growing up. Growing up. Um, we are very intimately connected, um, psychically maybe. Uh, and it seems that I have a similar thing with my daughter. Um, but my mother is from that generation that um, that femininity thing. Um, she was really good at it. Um, she was a pro. So I watched my mom have total control of the family and yet have my dad feel like he was in control. Um, <laughs> And she was the epitome of grace in all that traditional way. And I kind of absorbed that through osmosis and, um, and spent a lot of my time kind of fighting it, trying to re rework the way I feel with my body and, and so forth. And then I kind of gave up on it. But I mean, really that question of, you know, what do we want to do with that femininity? Like, should we just throw it all out, or is there something valuable in it? And how to negotiate that for myself? Um, I think I've come come back to think that it's not a good idea to just throw it all out because there's some really beautiful things about it. So, um, but you also did an early work in the Jubert. Yes, I did a work where I tried to turn my mom into my dad and my dad into my mom using prosthetic makeup. And that was really interesting because um, uh, it was a really hard process for my mom. And I don't think it was because I was making her a man, but that I was making her old and ugly. And I think that she's, she's a very beautiful woman and, and her identity was very much is very much part of that beauty and, and you know it's hard it was very hard for her to to let go of that um, for the photo um, so it makes the photo really charged i think that wasn't for your dad um my dad who was like really like you know i know you're a feminist why do you want to dress me like a woman are you making fun of me when i brought the the wig and dress home, he put it on, the dog started barking at him. <laughs> my brother's in the shower, he goes down, opens the shower, stall, starts, my brother starts screaming, and he's like, wow, I can get a lot of attention this way. <laughs> but the funny thing is that no matter what I did to my dad, when I put the camera on him, he would, his self shone through, even dressed with this crazy wig and prosthetic makeup and stuff. And, but then my mom was the opposite. I was like erasing her. And so it took me about a year and a half to make that photo because I had to create the conditions for them to act like each other because even though I was getting better and better at the makeup, they were getting more and more self-conscious. So 
was a big, it was like being at family therapy event. <laughs> and um, I thought, like, they're unconditionally supportive of me, and I thought, but they didn't get the work. So I thought if I put them in the work, then they have to deal with the content. Of course, my content is their baggage, so they won't deal with it at all. <laughs> I'm happy to say that we come full circle and it's hanging in their dining room. <laughs> they joke that I've um, immortalized them as monsters. <laughs> so, but Paul looks like he wants to stop us. I hate to do this, but. Can I say something before you stop us? Absolutely not, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to, to thank um, Janet and Jonathan that it's such a privilege for me to have such minds put their attention on my work, so thank you. Likewise, thank you. absolutely. Because it's the work people. It's the work people.